And just like that, we are live uh, to the Elephant and Castle community. I'm Nick from Retribe, and joining me today is Audrey Zander, who is um, a leadership coach, and a, you use the term fulfillment coach. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. And which which we're going to get into. Yeah. Um, you you've made your journey from the corporate world to finding a place of purpose, and you're even planning retreats in beautiful places, which I can't wait to hear more about. Uh, but Audrey, thank you so much for joining me today. And can you introduce yourself to the community? Let everybody know, you know who you are and what you do. Yeah. Hi, Nick. Hi, community. Um, I'm a fulfillment coach. <laughs> this is that's a term I came up with not long ago. So who am I? Oh gosh, where do I start? Um, I'm a third culture kid, nomad since birth. I've traveled a lot, lived in 10 countries. Um, that's my norm, my comfort zone, I suppose. And I worked in the corporate world for 13, 14 years um, in London and Sydney and Dubai and Tahiti in Europe in different countries. And I was in investment banking for a while, luxury hospitality for a while. And I was in marketing and comms um, mainly. And then left that after, well, that's a whole story in itself. Um, my, my personal life and my bucket list were always a bit more important than my career. So I made my career work for my personal life. And once I had ticked off a number of things, I started burning out, burned out twice in two years with two companies. And by the second one, which interestingly was three years ago. So I left the corporate world in three days, it'll be three years ago. So there's a, an anniversary coming up and I've been a coach since. So I completely changed um, path and I do leadership coaching and life coaching. Uh, sorry about the ambulance out there. Um, and I've now called it fulfillment because what I want in life is fun and fulfillment. And so there we go. That's very quick nutshell intro. It's, it's, it's a great introduction and judging from the, the tone of the ambulance that was going by, uh, you're not in the UK. It, it sounds like you are in France, um, yes. which which is, you know, I, I, I know you come from a corporate world here. Like we actually did without knowing it. We, we uh, you were one of my clients um, 13 years ago when you worked at Investec, which is a very large investment bank. And um, you've made your way now in your journey, which is is, is your coaching where you're you're able to kind of have the, the, the fun and the fulfillment of being able to work in different places. And you're based in Southern France right now, right? I am, I am. I'm between Cannes and Saint-Tropez, which sounds very glamorous. Um, and it it's does. very, very, it's, it's so busy now. It's the inter entire world has descended upon Saint-Tropez and Cannes and it's uh, sunny and nice, yeah. Beautiful. And I am stuck between two buildings in Soho. <laughs> My view is just brick and pigeon netting. So uh, it's not as beautiful as where you are, but um, I'm grateful to be where I am. And Audrey, you know, I want to, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And I want to get more into the, that, that, you know, like so many people now that I, I, I talk to that have, have worked in the, in the corporate world and in the investment banking world or accounting or law, um, something just felt a little bit unsettled or restless with them. And They've been brave enough to kind of follow that intuition uh, mm -hmm. and those those instincts to be able to say, you know what, I don't fit in here. I'm not getting any fulfillment in my life, any life purpose. And I know that from the work that I do, what I've seen is a lot of people working nowadays just for a paycheck. And um, even in just the research that, that that has been exposed to me that I didn't. And this is the one piece that really blew me away was that 50 percent of anyone who's working for you. 50% of the staff that you have are looking for another job right now. Um, and that's, that just blew me away when I was thinking, wow, if you had like, you know, like just any number, half of them are looking for other work. And it's not necessarily because they're not um, enjoying the, 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 the place that they're in. It's just that they're not feeling, I have, there's an animal walking behind you. Uh, chaos just walked by. Yeah. Um, they're just not feeling that the, the fulfillment, I suppose, and the purpose. And, and maybe that's kind of something we can kind of start off with because it's something that I, I've, I've found so necessary in my life is that I finally have found purpose. Uh, when is it in your journey that you were like, I'm not fulfilling my purpose? Um, pretty early on. Uh, so as I mentioned, my personal life, I always just wanted to have fun. I had my midlife crisis at 22 when I realized I didn't like either myself or my life. And this whole kind of um, 
journey started and I made it my, my quest to find happiness, have fun and on, on a daily basis, uh, very early. So I always liked kind of going against the grain and not uh, life in terms of school, uni, job, house, mortgage, family, that, that was never something I aspired to, towards. So I always kind of liked doing my own thing. And my quest to have fun every single day and not wait for retirement was present very early on. Um, I kind of fell into corporate life through my personal intentions and bucket list. I wanted to go um, live in London and through the work I was doing at the, same, at the time in Cannes in the south of France, through contact networking, I had a job opportunity in investment banking in London. I went for an interview thinking, I don't know, I'll figure it out and got the job and that's how corporate life started. And that's pretty much how everything then continued my entire career. I decided I wanted to move to a new place. I would resign, move, find something or have something before I went there. So um, I was always leading by my personal life and bucket list destinations where I wanted to live. But early on corporate life, I felt like I was playing a part, a role. It never felt I could be entirely myself. Um, I fell into it and some of them were amazing. I mean, my years at Investec were so, I loved it. The culture at the time, the people, the, the project, that was really good fun. And that masked a little bit the fact that internally I knew this wasn't my place. It was fun because of what I was doing and the people, but I knew corporate life, the values, being at a desk every day. There were so many different things where I'm a bubbly personality. I love being with people, being creative, spontaneous. And so early on, I was like, hmm. And at that time, even when I was at Investec, in parallel, I had I started a sports and remedial massage degree. Uh, so I did that for a year in parallel, not thinking I want to do this full time, but there was already an interest in branching out. And then I did yoga teacher training years later while still in corporate. So I think I knew early on, but I didn't have the courage to step out of it for fear of not knowing what else I wanted to do. Money, the gap in the CV, like the, those, those usual fears. Um, but yeah, I think it's present for a long time before I or other people actually do something about it. You said something that really struck home with me is that when you're in work, in work you couldn't really show your true self. Yeah. And, and you know, that brought me right back to when I, I started working in TV. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a bit like you, I want to have fun. I've always been quite young hearted in nature. Even when I was in my 20s, I was like, you know, I acted like a 20 year old. I was quite childish. And I like to kind of goof around and have some fun. And it was just my natural sense. So when I got into an environment, people were like, Nick, you know what? You shouldn't smile so much. You make, might make people feel a bit awkward. You're a little bit too friendly. You know, um, sometimes you have to, you know, and I got it, but it made me all of a sudden go like, wow, I can't be happy Nick. Yeah. And, and from then I learned, because I, I wasn't taught anything about going into broadcasting or the corporate world. They were just, I was just, I just started my own business or, you know, I, I, I wangled my way into a job at Sky Sports. And, uh, and like I say, right off the bat, it was like, there was all these, these, these restrictions or ideals that you had to kind of be um, in these environments. And, I, and so since then, my brain was like, you better really always have a facade on, you know, depending on if you're talking to your producer or your line manager or CEO or a, a colleague who does the same work with you, it's almost like you have to have these different facades or these different yeah. masks for everyone. And it's all performance. It's all a performance. And it was tiring. It's like, why can't I just be myself? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I see now is just like, because of the fears of being judged or the fears of being seen as weak or you know any kind of expression of vulnerability, you're gonna be kind of, that, that will be exposed. So. Um, in most of the places that, that I'm experienced to now, it's again, people just feel like they cannot be them true, their true self. So I suppose, how did that feel to you? How did it feel in the corporate world where you're like, you know, the true, real Audrey can't come out and it's always performance. And, you know, th does that create more anxiety than uh, uh, actually the repercussions of you being yourself? Yeah, it's exactly what you mentioned. It's, it's exhausting, it's draining, and there's, it can spiral into creating a lot of self-doubt, imposter syndrome, um, because you lose, or yeah, I lost my identity in the process. 
um, because I didn't feel I could be my completely bubbly, childlike, spontaneous. What the, I did have to wear a mask, or so I thought. Um, I think things are changing, but it depends on the industry, the company, the leadership, on everything, of course. Um, but it was exhausting. It was draining, and it felt like I was wasting my life away in a way. I I think also I was in my mid late twenties until mid thirties when I was in the corporate world, where I think there's also a whole bunch of um, introspection and developing and getting to know oneself that happens as well as an adult who we are. And then when you you're in an industry where you feel you in order to fit in and keep your job and perform and, and, and you need to be a certain type of person. There's a clash from what's going internal on internally and externally. And there's a gap between who you want to be. And you're not sure about who that person is and how to express it and how you think you need to show up. So it's exhausting. It feels, I felt very trapped. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, trapped by the systems too, that the corporate world are, are established by. Now, a lot of people are going to, maybe hear this part that I'm about to say and go and, and be like, no, this isn't true. But from my experience, may, corporate environments are traditionally masculine environments um, where they're patriarchal and there'll be, um, you know, CEOs that have been traditionally men um, and they have been brought up on certain ideals of, you know, not crying, not showing emotion, um, you know, bottling things in, uh, never showing weakness. And these, I believe, have built systems in the corporate world, whether it's advertising or investment banking or, um, you know, whatever the industry is, um, because of the systems that have been set up over the last, say, 50 to 70 years, you know, post-World War II, when everyone was coming out with these kind of victorious and Churchwellian kind of quotes, you know, um, that, that this, this now is like intrinsic in our systems and it's systemic in the way that corporations have been built. And yeah, you, you, I do agree with you, things are changing. Um, but when people say that, um, specifically, I suppose I'm, I'm talking about the women that I've been able to be exposed to where they feel that, um, you know, these environments of, and I'm not talking about, okay, this is gonna be confusing, but th I'm talking about masculine, not necessarily male, but masculine systems of structure, order, law, rigidity, um, you know, performance, uh, a masculine energy. <clears throat> and I think the corporations are quite set up on that. So I don't want to be pointing fingers that men are to blame or women are to blame or anything like that. I'm talking about like the systems. Yeah. And for anybody to be able to fit into these systems, I'm quite a sensitive guy. So me to fit into these corporate systems, I did never, I never really felt like um, like they, like they, I could fit because I'm quite emotional. And if I wasn't able to express my fears or be able to shed a tear without fear of being, you are weak and you are, you know, these derogatory terms, uh, that would come out, uh, if I showed any kind of emotion, then I suppose it is for everybody that, that it's hard to express emotion. So let's, from your pers perspective, as a woman in the corporate world, fitting into these traditionally masculine environments, what were the hurdles that you came across? Big one. Sexism, massive. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm I know things are changing. I'm grateful things are changing. It's high time. But as you mentioned, probably most of the men who were just dropping sexist remarks didn't even realize it, it was sexist because it was so, so ingrained. And it's just this male world and testosterone and calling everybody love and darling and um, commenting on clothing or appearance or just even snide remarks or joking about taking notes or getting a coffee or just all these things and or not being invited and or not being heard or listened to um, at meetings and or seeing um, the the leaders having temper tantrums and, and screaming and yelling at their staff. Um, and that ripples then down to the people below and below and below in the hierarchy and not being allowed to say, so there are so many things that, and shutting up. Um, I think I only started having the confidence when I started getting coached a few years ago, because I didn't really know what it was prior to that. And I started to learn about my values, my boundaries, 
um, my voice, what's important, what do I say yes and no to, what's a non-negotiable, starting to love myself, self-worth, self-confidence, which was non-existent prior to that, and I would never speak up. And then I would have this, this internal inferno blazing within in my stomach and in my chest and my throat and, and just bottling it up and not knowing how to speak up. So, so many, so many. Um, I don't miss it. I, I really do not miss it. And I, that's why one of the re that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about supporting women with my coaching now, because it's, it comes from a very personal space. And I wasn't some, I wasn't an introvert. So you have to even realize I wasn't an introvert. I was quite confident from the outs looking at me. And yet there was so much I bottled in, so much I was like, well, if I'm gonna speak back, then they're gonna be like, oh, come on, you're it's just a bit of humor. You don't you 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 don't know how to be fun and da-da-da. So this gaslighting as well, this protection of the male um, in those. I'm not saying it was everywhere, it wasn't every day. I don't want to paint a picture either, but it does did does happen. Yep. And it's not just like as I mentioned, it's not just about men doing this. Like women in, in power women positions, well. you know, That's you know. So it, it, yeah, you know. And I think it's this this whole idea of power down, right? And wherever you are, if you're a man or a woman in these kind of senior positions, senior leadership roles, C-suite type roles, it's a, this power down and authoritarian kind of rule that we have seen. And and I know it is changing, but this is the, one of the things that I'm I'm going to ask you because I'm actually ask going to ask for some advice here. But when I'm working with men who who can't see it yeah they're like nick no no it's it's just harmless fun when like an example that you talked about an example that somebody had was a a, a woman who was coming out of the covid restrictions uh, a female who had was coming back into the office for for the first time in a long time decided she'd wear her hair differently mm -hmm. and a male colleague said um oh you should wear your hair the other way it looks better you know, you look silly like this. And now he thinks, harmless remark, this woman actually goes home shattered and doesn't go back into the office now for fear of people commenting on the way she looks. Um, um, if I'm talking to a man about that, they'd be like, oh, she, it's just harmless remark. So how do we help men to understand that these comments are damaging, um, are, can create, you know, can, can, can open up wounds of trauma, you know, where a man might just think, oh, it's a harmless bit of banter it's actually not how mm. you know and how how would you suggest that that conversations start happening with men in powerful positions to say no commenting on the way someone looks um which i was always taught to do you know i was like if if if, if you see somebody man or woman if they've done themselves up you know comment on the way they look you know make sure you say oh that's a nice dress or that's a nice suit and 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 there's almost this thing of like it is harmless but also, we're in this world now where we just don't understand other people's traumas and wounds and things that they're bringing into the work environment. So how do we let people know that, that their comments can, can, even though they're coming from a, a place of, of an unharmful place, it can create harm? I think as a rule of thumb, would you say the same thing to your mate? Would you comment on your mate's appearance, your male colleague's appearance? There's just this permission to comment on women. It doesn't go the other way. Would you ask your male colleague to go fetch you a coffee? Would you comment on, hey, you're wearing a new suit. You've changed your hair. You should do it the other way. It doesn't look good. Would you do it to a man? If not, don't. And if it's in the workplace, do not comment on appearances. People are here to do their jobs. If there is something negative about appearance, ask your HR to deal with it. But it's, it's nobody's place to comment on somebody else's appearance. I remember also the few times I dared go in with less makeup. Oh, you look sick. Oh, are you okay? Or are you, whoo, this is how I look naturally. Thank you very much. All right, well, apparently I'm not up to standards um, in terms of my looks if I'm not ma made up. It's very hurtful when you, the woman might be going on a date or not, or doing it for herself or not, but she's definitely not doing it for her male colleagues and leaders to comment on. Um, and as you mentioned, it does open wounds that people around you aren't aware of. Some trauma from bullying or confidence issues in childhood and teenage years, and it's just off the table. It's a conversation that should not be happening. If you have a if you have a relationship and it's a friendship or whatever, then start 
building your emotional intelligence first mm -hmm. and stop commenting on appearances altogether would be my request. Unless we come back from lunch and you have a bit of spinach in your tea. But say it in a way that's not going yeah. to make the other feel awful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's the thing, trying to yourself that that's the whole emotional intelligence and, and mm. awareness. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Try yeah. at least and do it in a way that's also not in public. Yeah. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, give the other person a chance to react in whatever way they might need to react or want to react and don't make it a thing in public because for you it's nothing but the other person you have no idea. It is delicate. Yeah. It is a delicate yeah. uh, conversation. I think that as a general rule, yes, you're, you're right. It's really hit home to me is that commenting on anybody's appearance. Even the other day, I splashed water on my my shirt and my, mm. the top of my my shorts. And someone was kind of made a joke because I was coming back from the bathroom. And they were like, wow, you know, like you have your pee pants. And, and it was this thing of like this huge embarrassment because I looked down and I had water on my t-shirt and the top of my shorts and stuff. And, and I felt so awful. And I know it was like kind of done out of, out of a joke or anything like that. And people obviously want, but just for that person to be able to pull me aside and say, hey, buddy, do you know what I mean? You spilled some water on yourself. And I know it's just a simple thing, but um, but I, I think as a general rule, you're right. You know, commenting on anybody's appearance or anything that's happened, I think it should be done with tact um, and kindness and compassion because, um, I mean, I was I was super embarrassed, you know, and I, and, it, and I go really red when I'm embarrassed and it takes me yeah. about 45 minutes to settle down afterwards. Um, and I know that that's, that's just a case study there, but um, I, I really like that a, a bit of advice and I hope people can adhere to that. It's I, just- I hope so. Yeah. Really yeah. do it one-on-one. -on -one, and if you really can't hold yourself back or you're learning, ask a question rather than making a remark and thinking that your opinion matters. Um, mm. Say your hair looks better the other way. Who asked you? How, why yeah. does it matter what you think? If you really are learning and fighting the urge to comment, then try doing something a bit more out of curiosity. Hey, you changed your hair. Mm. And see how the person rea reacts. And then yeah. see if there's a conversation, which shouldn't be a conversation, but unless it's to be, hey, you look good or nice or whatever, be uplifting. Because your opinion honestly does not matter. <laughs> no, no. Um, so the, so now as a, as a, as a coach, um, mm -hmm. I'm interested to know in the programs that you've developed, um, mm -hmm. where did they, where did, what did the inspiration come from? How have you developed them? And, um, I've noted that there are some programs for women, uh, women in leadership roles. So I'm, I've kind of, can we go into the kind of the development of the programs and then how you felt drawn towards making these, um, these programs for women in leadership roles? Yeah, um, so initially I started out when I started coaching, it was very much individuals one on one life coaching. And I made it very early on, it became primarily women. Um, because of what I explained already that this just personal connection and wanting other women to find their voice claim their voice that they deserve to go for their dreams and what I've observed many women don't really have a life vision. Um, we're not necessarily taught to dream big and go for those dreams. It's okay, be content, settle, um, be happy, your life's good already. And very rarely are women or girls taught to really go for everything they desire. So I'm very passionate about supporting women and building them up um, to go and reach for the stars. Um, and so throughout the years, I just observed the, the main topics that women came to me Four. And a lot had to do with self-love, self-confidence, um, communication, speaking up, uh, the self-sabotaging negative thoughts and voices, um, imposter syndrome, money, money mindset and conversation is a big one amongst women. And so I created a program for women more in terms of life coaching, a group program. And then as I started branching out into organizations, um, there are two directions that I go. One is indeed women, where it's a leadership accelerator program, where we create a community for women to speak up, to share their stories, and to gain confidence in, in speaking up and stepping into their full potential. So, so it's very much um, directed around, well, around the topics that women specifically go through. 
And the fact that it's in a community is very uplifting because then they find out, hey, it's not just me with this experience, not just me with these thoughts and this imposter syndrome. So it's very uplifting. And then with organizations, the other thing I do is I bring in my corporate communications background because I worked internationally at CEO level, C-suite level, stakeholders, um, top clients, and uh, in internal communication, external communication also. And um, with the internal communication, it was also with crisis, uh, dealing with crises, um, employee engagement, satisfaction. So there's a whole lot of knowledge there that I now combine in a leadership program that's very much um, around communication. So how do you show up? How do you speak? How do you influence and impact? What are you motivated by? And I weave in coaching. So the emotional intelligence and self-awareness building. So there's a program where it's very much about leadership communication and the other one, women, um, the accelerator program, and then one-on-one -on -one executive. And there's a whole bunch of things. And, and I, I want to, we'll get into Bora Bora next, but, oh, yes. um, <laughs> but because I'm just trying to figure out a way that I can, I can go to Bora Bora. Um, anyway, um, how doesn't? important is it? Yeah. How important is it though, that, that you're working with women in leadership roles, but also on that corporate level, but there's gotta be the balance because, you know, if you're working with, with, uh, with these women and these either as individuals or groups, they're still in an ecosystem that might not accept the work that you've been doing with them. So it's kind of this thing of like, you've got to work with the, the corporate on the cultural level too. So it's providing the solutions to the people, but also to, you know, management to make sure that that ecosystem can facilitate. Um, you there? Frozen? That you or me? <laughs> um, hey folks, I don't know, I think. Audrey has frozen. Um, so I think Audrey's frozen. I think we might have to jump in and out. Okay, so I'm gonna just try to figure things out with Audrey. She might kind of, um, we might have to come back in a second, okay? Oh, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait, she's logged out um and see if she logs back in uh i think her wi-fi has obviously gone down i'm going to keep mine going because logging in and out is, is not nice so we'll just figure out when she's going to come back in okay she's probably just rebooting but we're talking about how um you know you can be working with clients uh, either one-on-one -on -one or in groups uh, and giving them solutions and self-awareness and self-expression and some vulnerability work and some compassion work. But unless the, the systems or the corporate environment doesn't change uh, alongside of the, the, the workshops that's going on, then you're kind of fixing um, broken with broken. And, and it's not going to, uh, it's not going to be able to, you're, again, you're kind of fixing people, you're putting a bandaid band on the solution, I suppose, is you're giving them you know, these tools, but when they get back into that work environment, they are not working. So um, let's see where Audrey is. Uh, hold on a second. I'll keep this thing going live still. There she is frozen. And let's see where she is now. She's coming back. I'm going to email her. Hold on a second. Um, And then I'm sending her an email with a link again. Okay, folks, let's just hang tight. Let's see what happens uh, if she's coming back in. Um, Wi-Fi happens like this around the world, right? There she is. Here we go. And there we go. I'm so You're back. sorry. I'm so sorry, no. my wife dropped, and I'm not so, moving. No, it's okay. We actually kept it going, so I'm actually kind of happy that I didn't jump out because isn't it funny? We were talking that is when it gets really hot out. This is when tech goes all funny. But oh, you're back. But Audrey, we we're talking about how you, you know you can be working with individuals or groups um, and giving them you know tools for transformation, personal growth, professional growth, growth, but if they're heading back into the work environment or the corporate ecosystem and that doesn't change, then you're kind of fixing broken with, with broken and it's not gonna, 
men. So it's really important to get the balance right, isn't it? Between being able to work with the individuals, but also being able to work with the corporation on the cultural level so that they make they can actually mesh somehow. And that's what that's the beauty of what you do. You go in and take care of that culture and community building. And um, it's so important to have the, both of those aspects because as you mentioned, I and other experts and, and um, specialists in, co in coaching and communication and leadership and well-being, et cetera, et cetera, can do their work. But if the company isn't addressing other issues internally where they might indeed need experts as well, then it's always going to clash and they might lose their people because it's one thing to invest and support in somebody's growth. But if you're not investing in the company's growth um, in parallel, then you might be losing that person. Mm. And I'm finding out so much stuff on my journey too, my investigation of how companies create the culture. And the, the really interesting things that I'm finding is that, um, you know how companies will take their, their staff out on like, like corporate lunches or weekend retreats, yeah. or they'll give them like Christmas hampers with really nice stuff in it. You know, like nine, not about 80% of the responses that we have from those things are the people go, I wish the company just gave me the money yeah. that they use to spend on these things. And it makes me really think of the disconnection, you know, from, from leadership to people, because they think that by getting all of the staff on a boat on a Friday afternoon and bringing them out to the Solent and doing a bit of like, I don't know, water skiing or fishing or something like that, um, that they're creating this, these kind of bonds normally lubricated with some kind of alcohol and food. And, uh, and the response back is people are like, you know, that was a waste of an afternoon. And I just, you know, I know that it was a couple hundred pounds per head and I wish they would have just given me the money. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, that's, so it's a really interesting when I give that feedback to some corporations that around 80% of the people that are involved in these things just don't like them. So it's made me, it's not that they don't like them. It's just, they wish they would rather have the money. It's, and it's really, again, it's made me think of the disconnect between, you know, the, the leaders or the, the you know, the top level executives and C-suites to the actual people who are working for them. It's a huge disconnect. It's a huge disconnect. And when I think back, uh, the companies where I enjoyed those kind of team buildings and the ones where I didn't, it very much had to do with the company and the culture in general and how happy I was working there in general. The ones where the culture was good and uplifting and supportive um, and working there was fun then yeah I'm all in to have some team building and getting to know my peers uh, my, my colleagues in a different way and letting off steam and it's fun because I want to spend time with them and I enjoy spending time with them in the companies where I was just doing my job and just kind of waiting for for the day to end and when is my next holiday and 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 yeah give me the money I don't want to be spending more time with you because it's hypocritical yeah. I don't want to be, you're, you're pretending or you're making out that this is team building and, and but it's not. So that's, to me, the disconnect is what's the, what's the message and the culture in general and don't sprinkle here or there of trying to do a bit of magic on a one-off. Yeah, I find it's, it's really about the, the, what I've seen what works is, is people who spend time on helping people create relationships. Yeah. because you can you you know if you're enjoying going to work with the colleagues that you work with you know spend time on helping people build relationships rather than you know um like i say money on certain things where they can't appreciate it because they're not in a they're not in a community of people they're rather they're just as individuals going to work for a paycheck um so i think those are definitely suggestions for solutions for companies you should listen and and look up look us up um and Especially I want to get into this now with sorry just with with companies returning to the office and struggling big time because so much has changed in the past years and people's perspectives and needs and um realizations have evolved and companies are trying to go some of them are trying to go back to the old ways and that's not going to happen mm -hmm. Community is so important. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the key, and it's really interesting that you say some people are looking back at the old ways, and that's one thing that I found out in research too is that masculine traded people tend to look to the past for solutions, and the sacred feminine tend to look to the future for solutions. So I think that is again a shift in kind of compassion, vulnerability, and understanding, creativity, community. You know, those are our sacred feminine traits, and I think that if we start to kind of embrace those, not as like woo language 
And I know <laughs> that's a bit of a, a, a thing that people have a hard time with is, uh, is the language. But I think that if we just start looking to, you know, for, for new ways to, to, to come up with stuff, new ways to embrace, um, you know, corporate life and culture. And yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Power. Misha, Jer Misha is our, my, 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 she's my Yoda. She's the woman that works uh, uh, at Brunel University and advises Retribe. And she always says, Nick, it needs to be power up. It you know, does. we need to live in a, in a power up uh, corporate world, sports culture, everything needs to be power up instead of power down and, and it'll make things a lot easier. Okay, so as I said, we are kind of like 45 minutes flies by and we haven't got into you and your, your, I kind of, your want, your needs, your desires to create new fulfilling things. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody, you know, si you know, sitting there coming up with ideas for clients. And then, uh, you know, you did mention about some retreats that you're, that, that, that you're thinking about in some beautiful parts of the world. Um, as, as, as someone who works in your position, who's already come up with programs and, uh, and, and products to sell to corporations, when is it that you just sit back on, on go, this is good? Or why, you know, what is it that you're kind of keep dri driving towards finding other solutions and other avenues and where retreats now getting people in person together um, has become so important? Um, so I don't think I'll ever be the person who thinks this is good and I'm leaving it like that because from the get go, I want to be co-creating the programs with the companies. Um, so mm -hmm. I have the, the foundations um, but then it's through conversations with the companies and the teams and the leaders that I create the programs. So there will be some aspects that don't change very much where I think these are the foundations they need to, they, they will take place. But then depending on the needs, the objectives, the current challenges, the personalities of the teams, I will adjust and I will suggest different avenues so that we then create a very bespoke program for that client in particular. Um, with the in-person, well, I personally have a need to be with people more and more because the last few years have been complicated. And also I've been doing everything virtually. I live in a bit of a remote place and this need and desire to be with people um, is very big. And I think a lot of people have that and getting somewhere where you can be with like-minded people in a growth mindset, um, discovering being curious in a beautiful setting. I've lived in some of the most beautiful places in the world. I mean, I'm in South France now, but I lived and worked in Tahiti for three years um, where I'm, a, I'm signing a client now to go and do a leadership communication program for one of the resorts over there, which is part of my background as well. And I, I'm wanting to create these kind of retreats in person where I gather other experts to really create a bespoke experience for people to take a big breath, a uh, big, big breath of fresh air again and reassess, okay, those were the old ways. Who am I now? Where do I wanna go? What kind of leader am I? What do I wanna do with my space? So all these different things are creating that in-person experience, which I think is gonna be amazing and so much fun. I love it. And it's something that I, um, you know, I know I'm, I'm kind of driven towards too, is that I was always, ReachPad was always set up to be um, a platform that uses technology, mm -hmm. you know, to have people interact like we are now, but ultimately that gets people together. So I was, yeah. I was saying, you know, then that's the essence of a, becoming a part of a tribe is this in-person connection that you have with a group of people um, because it creates accountability. And that's the one thing that I thought, wow, you know, I've been lacking accountability in my life for so long that it just, it, I had no, there was no checks and balances in my life. I literally had the freedom to do whatever I wanted. And, and, no, and towards the end, that was isolation, alcohol use, um, just very destructive uh, coping strategies for my life because I had no one to be accountable to. And, and I think that this is why, why I, I really do believe that retreats are so important to get people together for, you know, whether it's three days or five days or a week, you're creating these bonds that then gets you out into, you know, you go back into kind of your, your, your work life or your, your personal life, but you've always created these bonds with people who have found some kind of similarity in, in challenges or struggles. Um, because it's like, man, I've been there with you. You know, and, and I think that's what's so great is it's like, wow, you've been there with me too. Uh, let's, let's hold the hands. 
and let's get through this together. And then in, in that time together, you, you have these bonds. And I have bonds with people that, you know, I've met maybe two or three times in person, but they'll be like brothers for life because we've had similar challenges or, or you know, we've looked each other in the eye and, and literally have said that I've got you, man, I've been there too. Um, and it's so, so important for people to still have human interaction in this world of, of virtual Zooms, et cetera, that I love, but there's no, there's no getting away from getting in, in, in person with people. And those conversations very often happen outside of whatever courses or training mm. you're attending. So they're the ones that will happy, happen over a coffee or over dinner or a walk. But you're there with people who you know are on a parallel journey. So there's just a more openness to speak, and to and that is more difficult to do with the virtual world. Yeah. yeah. So how does how does Bora Bora fit into your life over the next little while? So my vision, my intention, my dream um, is to be going over there a few times a year for different clients, um, which I'm manifesting. Because uh, an old, well, former colleague uh, got in touch knowing what I'm doing now and asked me to create a program for his managers, for the resorts managers to bring, because this is a, so we touched on, but in the hospitality industry, something that's been lost with Generation Z now is the, the passion and the pride of working for a brand, for working for um, a company. And hospitality is all about the human service. And at this level of these, these clients over there, it's high luxury. And so when you've got mid 20, early 20 year olds who come in and with the great resignation and the last few years and Generation Z and the social media, et cetera, the way they're, they're very often, their mentality, their perspective on work is very different to ours. And so millennials, Gen X, and so on. So things are evolving and leadership is out of touch in terms of how to motivate them. Um, the fact that there are now chief happiness officers in many companies, the fact that what we spoke about, it's not a one-off team building that's gonna do the trick. It's what are you giving them on a, on a constant basis and it's about their personal development. So what, I'm, what I've created for them um, and I'm waiting for it to find out when I'm gonna go is, the whole emotional intelligence and personal development before we even go into their needs and their standards of luxury and intuitive service and 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 so i'm kind of going back a little bit in my hospitality luxury hospitality background which is going to be so much fun and because of the contacts i've got there it's just going to i'm manifesting this it's going to be a ripple effect yeah. and i'm going to help all the five-star resorts in french polynesia <laughs> that's what's happening well <laughs> yeah, I think I think I'm gonna manifest myself as a position there because I used to work as a towel boy in a five star hotel. So, um, and my experience now, so I think I, I I fit in in that luxury hospitality world somewhat. But um, it's it's, 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 to, it's what you were mentioning that foundation of the raising self awareness and emotional intelligence. That's the one that I'm not letting go of. I create bespoke programs afterwards, be it banking, tech, whatever the needs and the industry is. However, that part, that's the one that I'm passionate about. That's my, where my genius is. And it, it's so important to give the people their self-awareness first before they can understand and connect with the company's values and objectives and uh, the community building and having that common objective and project for belonging to start happening and pride to start happening of belonging to that project, et cetera. Yeah. I think there's a lot of work um, for, for, for individuals, but for companies, sports organizations, everything, you know, we, there's a lot of work that needs to happen, but it's not hard. And I, that's what I want oh. people to know is that this isn't hard. And they think that they've got to come up with, with all of these protocols for evolution and for change or transformation. When, as you know, like the protocols don't really change a lot. It's really like the, around the idea of self-awareness, you know, emotional intelligence, um vulnerability compassion you know and that th those happen in conversations they don't like you said like the, the things the magic things that happen is when two people talk together you know the dialogue between two people who've had a similar kind of challenge is is beautiful it's what you know it's one of the foundation stones of my whole life is just talking to another guy who's been through th similar things and it sets me up for the rest of the day um because the day is no longer about me 
Yeah. You know, and I think that if we can create cultures where it's no longer about me and it's about, I'm going to go to work for my colleagues because I love them uh, because they've been through some stuff and, and, and you feel this kind of this passion to go to work because you're part of a community rather than you're getting a paycheck. You're part of a bigger and, thing. And that's yeah. it, that it's something that's always been important to me in my career was understanding the bigger picture. How does my mm. role, fit? how am I contri contributing? What, what piece of the puzzle am I? And that's what I incorporate in my programs. I work with the leaders first on, their, on the company's vision and values because that's, that's kind of the, the thread all along the training of, and the coaching is how do you fit in? Because once we know we're part of this community and that our role impacts, influences this other person or this job or that, that's when we get motivated. That's when passion and pride can come up. But that, and that's why I work so much on communication because that overarches all of this community building and talent engagement and retention and work-life balance and, and, and that starts with awareness. So it's kind of reverse engineering. What are your ob objectives? Let's dial back. Let's look at the human aspect. Beautiful. What a way to end it. Um, Audrey, we're done. 45 we're minutes done. gone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or thank as they say so in much. French Polynesia and Tahitian, Maruru. Maruru? Maruru? Maruru. That's nice. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, if anybody needs to get in touch with you, do you have, do you want me to put anything in the Facebook feed or is there something you want to say now? AudreyZander.com. <coughs> mail, mail at AudreyZander.com. I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. I think I'm the, the only Audrey Zander, um, which I'm lucky. So get in touch. I offer free consultation calls. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thank, thanks for joining me. Thanks everybody for joining us. I'll put that stuff in the Facebook thanks, page. Yeah. Um, Audrey, don't hang up yet. I'll just, I'll just say goodbye to everybody. Um, thanks for joining me. And don't forget to join me on Thursday at 11 a.m. for another Tough Through Tender Gathering. And also, I still have to put in those links for the new conversation. So they'll be coming up soon. Um, thanks everybody. And we'll see you soon. Bye.